This episode is brought to you by the rotting corpse of Donkey Kong. Put out another game already. Do it, you you monkey boy! Go sell some sodas, Tommy! <laughs> Ah, oops. There exists a delicate balance between the responsibilities of work and your dignity as a human being. For example, I could have thrown myself into being a high school teacher and really dedicated myself to the craft of improving kids' lives. However, before I dedicated myself to that, I tried out substitute teaching and that showed me that I really don't have the disposition to do that incredibly stressful and very undervalued job, so I sought out other avenues. These days, I spend my time writing novels, teaching at universities, and making dirty jokes about the girlies making lemonade on YouTube. I bring all of this up because this episode of King of the Hill naturally sparks discussions on labor practices and how we approach the employer-employee dynamic. If you've worked just about any job out there, and especially if you've ever been self-employed, you'll certainly have come into contact with bosses that are, uh, for lack of a better word, too stupid to live. Buckley, what the hell are you doing? And as someone who's been on both sides of the work hierarchy, I understand that the statement, my boss is a stupid piece of shit, and my workers are lazy bastards, can both be true. As we go through this episode, I'll try to take a more neutral stance and note what I find resonates with my experiences and which adds enjoyment to my viewing pleasure. But what I will not do is try to problem solve Jimmy Wichard's behavior, as I don't think it'd be very fun for me to just say, he's dumb and wrong and why doesn't he just act like a better person? Doesn't he get it? over and over again. Like, it's just sort of a dead-end conversation. Like, okay, I get it. Sometimes there's times where you have to, like, say, oh, this person's acting a little weird, or this person shouldn't do that, or whatever. But Jimmy Witcher is such an interesting and unique situation that I don't want to say, like, oh, here's how he should be better, when the whole point of his character is that he's not better, and that he is, in fact, a giant piece of shit. Instead, let's take a step back and take a bird's eye view of things and see where the flaws in the system are. And speaking of a broken system, this episode begins with Boomhauer getting into a street race with a fella who ends up being a cop. Good evening, sir. Do you know why I pulled you over? Because you beat me. I want a rematch. Officer Asshole here tells Mr. Hauer about a race coming up, one where the winner gets the opportunity to drive the pace car for NASCAR, a prospect that Boomhauer jumps at, which is then an experience that is immediately soured by this vulgar display of power. Here. I'm gonna let that go. Between this guy and the lady who later molests Hank, King of the Hill doesn't really depict cops with a very sympathetic view, now does it? And of course, let's add this little incident to the pile of reasons as to why Boomhauer is almost certainly not a Texas Ranger. Cause if he was, then this jerkhole would be in some pretty deep doo-doo for fucking with the one thing that Boomhauer seems to truly love, his car, so like, Come on, like, I don't buy the whole, like, oh, uh, Boomhauer didn't report him because he was technically street racing and they both get in trouble. Like, fuck that. Like, he totally would get on this guy's ass for doing that. As it stands, though, this interaction gives us a solid motivation to root for the guys and gets us invested in tuning up Boomhauer's car. Because even if you don't give a crap about NASCAR, you really just want to see that cop get his comeuppance. Hey, guys, little help here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Man, it has been a while since the guys have all come together to work on a project like this, and I think this is actually one of the most enjoyable instances yet. And a lot of that has to do with the deepening of Dale and Bill's personalities that's been going on throughout Season 2. They are now able to bring much more to a scene, both from a conversational standpoint and in the gags that they can do. Time out! Man attached! Man attached! And once we've gotten our fill of car fixing jokes, Bobby then appears and begins our main conflict, namely his childish regards towards the weight of money. These checks aren't magic tickets. They represent real money that I, and to a lesser extent your mother, work real hard to earn. Something I think this episode does really well is its ability to weave together two seemingly unrelated subjects and naturally produce a believable scenario. Instead of Hank immediately taking Bobby down to the racetrack, he tries to do the old, like, here's a dollar, let's see how you can make it grow tactic. They say old Buck Strickland started out with nothing but a single dollar bill. And now he's at the top of the propane ladder. 
Hang on a second here, is that why he's called Buck? Like, okay, probably not, but that's a funny little possibility all the same. Not that it matters all too much, as I am calling bullshit on this whole Buck bootstrap mythology of the self-made man. A hundred bucks says that Mr. Strickland came from a dandy family, one with a few too many similarities to a certain Mr. Calvin Candy. That little bit of headcanon aside, I do think it's kind of funny how Hank uses this dollar technique as his own childhood was quite different from these, like, stereotypical family values of hard work and ooh, this is how you teach a kid about the weight of a dollar. I mean, just listen to how his own father taught him about money. My dad didn't buy me a car when I turned 16. He sold me one. And it was a lemon. Huh, I wonder if he paid sticker price for it. Ugh. I kind of think Hank is trying to raise Bobby in the way that Hank wishes he'd been brought up, connecting with the idealized 1950s dynamic that was so commonplace on older TV shows like Leave it to Beaver, The Waltons, and Little House on the Prairie. And to Bobby's immense credit, he does decide to make a smarter purchase than we might expect him to. Instead of getting Pokemon cards or a whoop-ass cushion, he instead goes for the thinking man's meal. This is what you spent your dollar on? No, I also got a quesadilla. It's from the value menu. I adore how Bobby is eating this burrito on his stoop like he's a fucking raccoon or something. <laughs> Like, why did he do that anyway? Peggy opens the door when she hears him talking to Hank, so, like, he easily could have just gone inside and eaten in, like, the dining room, but, like, he decides to eat outside in this weird position. Like, what's going on with that, Bobby? Are you okay? Are you are you sure you're not rabid? <laughs> and just in general, this is very, like, strange character placement. Like, who's ever on, like, Hank's stoop? It's especially weird because Bobby isn't trying to hide his meal from everyone. He's just outside eating. It's just, like, so weird. That's almost as weird as the thought that you could get that big-ass burrito and a quesadilla for just a dollar. I guess it's true what they say. Things really were better when it was Bill Clinton's America. But I'll get through to him. There's a way in there, I know there is. Our next important pivot comes at the Arlen Speedway, which is an extremely impressive thing for Arlen to have. At one point, the announcer says that they have a record-breaking 62,000 people in attendance, which just kind of blows my mind. And we have record attendance today with 62,427 fans. This place must have been built and funded by NASCAR itself, guaranteed. Oh, and I should also mention this fun little fact about me. Uh, my grandfather, two of my uncles, and three of my cousins on my father's side were actually drag racers. Not like big time professional ones, but they did race all the time down in LA in the 70s, and they even had their own funny cars. Hell, my uncle Terry is in his 70s and he still does races. It's wild, that guy is crazy. Too bad that my poor father, being the youngest sibling, was excluded from being a part of that world and was left behind with his mom while his two older brothers went off to the track with their dad, leaving him to darkle to his own devices and get into a lot of trouble, just like me! Which is all to say that this race car stuff does awaken certain memories and associations for me, a deeply nostalgic feeling that runs through the very roots of my family tree. And that's just on my father's side of things. You should hear about my mother's family, and specifically this one person that she had in her family who did some work for the Lawrence Livermore lab, work that he was legally not allowed to speak about to anybody. Vaguely terrifying and concerning family history aside, when Hank and Bobby arrive at the racetrack, they are met with a very pretty rope and a boy who seems a little too eager to get Bobby a job. Maybe someday you can land a job like this. Why not today? Pro tip for all you true believers out there, treat anyone who is this helpful with suspicion. Cause you're either about to have one of your organs removed or they're angling to get you man preg again. Thankfully, it just turns out that the kid was trying to get Bobby this job so Bobby could serve as his replacement in a terrible situation, which must be on the Mount Rushmore of dystopian story ideas, right up there with the thing everybody likes is secretly bad and other people make decisions for you. And pray tell, why is this kid so desperate to flee his job? Well, it's because of his boss, the ever-lovable, and, dare I say, the eternally breedable Jimmy Wichard. People up there are hot and dry. They want something cold and wet. You do your job, you make money, but you work hard, because that's the way you work if you want to work for Jimmy. You know, to be honest, sometimes I just say, like, weird shit to get a rise out of you guys, to shock a little gasp, ah, oh, unexpected laughter from your monocled face, bleh, which is why I said the whole breedable thing and should explain why I'm somebody that a friend of mine once described as, quote, a mind best left unexplored. 
<laughs> but to be serious for a second, Jimmy Wichard is truly a curiosity when it comes to side characters. He's someone with a vaguely defined mental handicap, call it a birth defect, or a case of getting hit on the head with a coconut, or cosmic radiation gone amuck. but whatever's going on with him, he's hardly what we in the professional circuits would call a bit of positive representation. In fact, we so rarely see special needs characters that are also total assholes that Jimmy sort of stands alone in that regard. The, uh, not that Jimmy, the other one. No, the other one. Yeah, 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 him. To so put on a hot dog, you. No way. And honestly, I'm really glad that he's not a positive person. Because as important as it is to have role models, there's an equally valid school of thought that says that negative role models serve an important purpose as well. And much like with Chris Chan, Jimmy is somebody that we can look towards and say with a relieved sigh, like, phew, thank God, at least I'm not like them. I may be cringe, I may wish that I was in the firm flippers of Duke the Dolphin, but at least I'm a little bit better than this motherfucker. And a little contempt, when directed at a truly repugnant person, or better yet, a fictional character, can really reinforce one's own confidence in your actions and say like, hey, you may not be perfect, but there's a lot worse things out there that you could be. With all of that said though, it is still interesting that Hank is able to see that Jimmy is a bit of an oddball, but seems to dismiss any possible concerns that he may have. So, if I understand you correctly, you're saying you'll teach my boy the value of a dollar. If you work for Jimmy, you're gonna work hard. You make money. The people are hot and dry. That sounds just fine. And rather than give Hank like this big pat on the back for his, oh, his noble willingness to disregard any reservations he may have for a special needs person at this job, I instead choose to believe that Hank is instead trusting the system, the powers that be, that brought Jimmy to this position. But because Jimmy is here, because he's in this position of authority, that itself is the proof of Jimmy's skills, of his competency, and all of that puts Hank at ease and sees Bobby sent off to his new job. Say cheese! Cheese! Don't smile, son, you're a working man. And before we take a look at Jimmy's whole part in this drama, let us first see how Bobby is doing on his first day on the job. Peanut! Peanut! <laughs> Ooh, ah, okay, ouch, hard throw, but the, you know, that's okay. I'm sure this hiccup will be made up for soon enough with hard work and just... Ah, oh, who am I kidding? The boy belongs at this job the way I belong at a smart guy thingy. And speaking as someone who once climbed to the top of the Basile of Sacré-Cœur, I'll tell you that these stairs ain't no joke. Oh, and big ups to this anonymous girl I saw while browsing the Google Street View around the church. What a frickin' legend. I love her. <laughs> Anyway, in his effort to bring a man a soda, Bobby learns why you never let your supplies out of sight. Oh, uh, is that diet? Reg regular. Sorry. <gasps> the detail of one cup being left behind is the thing that really seals the deal here. That is exactly what it's like being in food service. Oh, it just takes me right back and it's just, oh, just too real. And when Bobby returns to base camp, we begin to understand what kind of a petty prick Jimmy Wichard actually is. Hey, you, you want a hot dog? Sure. Hey, four fifty for a jumbo dog. You know, it's shit like this that is surprisingly disarming about Jimmy. He actually reminds me a lot of the villains of the Roll Doll books, those baddies that are straightforward and childishly cruel. His manner of speaking is also just too toothless to take seriously, and I get a big kick out of how blunt he is, a very, like, uncensored and very from-the-heart manner of expressing himself. Do it, you, you monkey boy! I'm the boss of you! I think the magical reason why I don't outright hate Mr. Richard is just because he's so easily dismissible. Except for a few rare exceptions, King of the Hill usually has a way of making some very mean characters quite likable. For example, Cotton is loud and bombastic, Buck is shameless and always on the verge of a heart attack, Mad Dog will say goofy shit like, go get my box of grenades, third shelf behind the cake mix, and Alabaster's got that dog in him. And for Jimmy, there's no one of a higher power around to back him up, no manager looming around, or a rich daddy saying, you can't find my son, or whatever. Jimmy is just sort of this, like, force unto himself, seemingly accountable to nobody, almost as if he were put in this position and then just immediately 
completely forgotten about. Plus, Bobby is just so wonderfully flat with him. The way he says, I'm not Tommy, I'm Bobby, goes a long way to showing this is not a threatening situation. Jimmy isn't an outright dangerous person, at least most of the time. He's just a big headache to deal with. Go sell some sodas, Tommy! <laughs> Ah, oops. And I'll give him this, he's rather good at his concessions job, concessions job, god that's kind of hard to say, uh, prepping food and filling trays in a manner that clearly still gets people to buy the food, he's just not someone who should be managing other human beings. He would make a much better meal prepper, or, as I think he kind of wants to be, a mascot. Mr. Witchard? Ooh. Huh? Okay, that's admittedly a little weird. Uh, you know what? Actually, you just know Jimmy's in there hotboxing stank ass hot dog farts all day in that spandex greenhouse. <laughs> Lordy! Ooh. Get me out of there and back to the hill house where we are then treated to this gorgeous scene on the porch, one where Hank is playing his guitar, waiting for his son to come home on his first day on the job, one where the light from the kitchen is mixing in with the gradual darkness of the late evening, the moment right before it becomes full night. Ooh, it's just so beautiful. It was at this point where I started to wonder, like, why is Bobby working this job and not in school? But then I looked back in the episode and found this quick little line from Peggy. Hank, it's his vacation. He's just a boy. He should be doing boyish things. Okay, so I'm on board now. It's, I suppose, Bobby's summer vacation or spring break or whatever. He's just not in school right now. That's all we need to know. He's on a vaguely defined break. That's fine. Also, before we get back to our evening under the stars, I'd like us all to hear and appreciate this haunting bit of out-of-pocket musing by Hank. I know we've never talked about this, but someday I'm going to die. And when that happens... Then you can go to cooking school. Yes, I could poke fun at Hank for having such a negative view of cooking when the majority of his income stems from people buying grilling supplies, but I think the show does that sort of thing well enough on its own. It kind of like lampoons its own sort of characters and says like, isn't this silly? And yes, yes it is. Hank's limited view on cooking is a built-in contradiction to the character, showing that an over-reliance on labels and worrying about whether or not something is manly tends to tie a person into a knot of blind spots and limited perspectives, to the point where knowing how to prepare food for yourself is seen as a negative characteristic somehow. Unless you're grilling, in which case you're the man putting food on the table. And since we're on the topic of limited perspectives, when Bobby comes home from work and tells Hank about all of the strange and difficult tasks that Jimmy is throwing down, Hank decides to tell Bobby that he's just being a lazy kid, one who doesn't actually want to put in the hard work. I know your first day was hard, but don't call your boss names. That's acting like a baby. Babies want everything handed to them. Oof, okay, a little bit of tough love there, but nothing too worrying quite yet. If you don't understand that, well, son, maybe you're the moron. Woo, okay, now that's a bit of a surprising turnaround from Hank. I know he's just throwing Bobby's own words back at the boy since he started the conversation by calling Jimmy a moron, but that still kind of catches you off guard. From here, Hank gives Bobby a few bits of advice, namely always say yes to the boss, go into problems with a can-do attitude, and when things get tough, you sing a happy tune. This is that thing about me giving 110%, right? Bobby, if you weren't my son, I'd hug you. It might surprise you to hear this, but I actually kind of agree with Hank's advice. These are actually pretty sound tips for surviving in a work environment, and especially if you say yes to your boss, then that relieves you of responsibility if things go wrong. I've actually done that before, where I know an order that I've been given is gonna fuck things up, and rather than argue with the person giving the instructions, I just do it and let the chips fall where they may. But I promise that was only in situations where I knew my boss or my manager or whatever wasn't receptive to my feedback, so I just decided to do it anyway. And I will say, after fucking things up, it does start to make your bosses sort of second-guess themselves, and, in the best-case scenarios, they will actually start asking for your input on what to do. Putting aside that little bit of malicious compliance, let's also acknowledge that saying yes to anything the boss says is obviously a like, oh, if your friends jumped off a cliff, would you do it too? type statement. And I feel like Hank is only giving this advice because he is, once again, trusting that Jimmy Wichard, the boss, knows best. 
He is putting his full faith into the system and doesn't consider the problem of blind adherence to somebody's orders. Hank's advice is kind of like saying water is good for you, which typically does make sense in a day-to-day -day context, but it doesn't ring true when you're drowning. But for a while at least, Bobby does actually see a marked improvement in his job performance after taking this advice, getting over the issues we saw on his first day, and going about his job with a genuinely positive attitude. My dad set me straight, and I'm gonna be the best worker you ever had. You work for me. You bet I do. In any other healthy work environment, Jimmy would now at this point take notice of Bobby's improvement and actually reward him for it. That's kind of the most basic strategy of managing humans. We like to be rewarded for the hard work that we put in, the extra bit of effort, and at first it seems like Jimmy is doing just that. How would you want to be my go-to guy? That's me! Okay. First, you go to the men's room and mop out the unirals. This is actually a really clever bit of wordplay here. Uh, we typically think of a go-to guy as the most dependable employee, the person the boss goes to when they need something really important done without any screw-ups. But Jimmy means this phrase quite literally as he makes Bobby the Kid Jimmy tells him where to go, that kind of go-to guy. You go to my cigarettes in my car, then go to back here. Can do! I'll admit, it took me a long time to figure this out. Very subtle show. At the same time Bobby's doing all of this, the other plotline concerns the guys training themselves to be Boomhauer's pit crew. And I gotta say, this whole side story here, which, like, I wouldn't exactly call a B-plot because it does have a fair bit of substance to it, is just kind of pretty... whatever. Like, don't get me wrong, it does have its moments, such as Bill taking his window cleaning task a little too seriously, and Dale's extremely well-animated hands holding this bucket of sand, but, like, that's kinda it. Dale, here's a bucket of sand. Hold it with both hands. What am I supposed to do with the sand? It's slip and hang! Never mind. This is sort of a prototype to the whole A Firefighting We Will Go episode, where the whole thing is centered around the balance between Hank's competence and his friend's bumbling. And there's nothing directly wrong with this part of the story, it just doesn't give me a lot to talk about because it's just sort of there. Like, these are just gags. Like, okay, they're fine, but there's not many character moments to talk about. Hey, look, it's Dale Earnhardt, and he's coming this way. Oh, it's the Intimidator. Oh. <laughs> However, what I do find interesting is Peggy's insistence on cataloging the accidents with her little disposable camera, which is sort of this like really nice niche thing for her to have and is later brought up in the second part of Propane Boom, where she's shown to deal with death by scrapbooking horrible accidents and tragedies. Wow. Oh, they beat the Aggies, but they could not beat that train. How morbid! Sheesh! I just, oh, I love Peggy so much. <laughs> But quick, let's distract ourselves from that. Uh, let's show the audience Bobby's latest task, one which I've actually done a few times myself. Smash it down good, Tommy. Smash it down. Don't be afraid of them bottles. They pop good. God, that takes me back. Crushing boxes and garbage at the wonderful wedding event center Casa Real. What a thigh-killing delight that job was. And much like how I sacrificed the marrow in my spine, lifting 50-pound trays on my shoulder, Bobby is out here volunteering to wear Jimmy's humiliating hot dog outfit. How come you keep wanting to do things nobody wants to do? Because I've got a can-do attitude, boss. Maybe one day I'll even have your job. The rest of my job? This is where we come to understand that there is absolutely no winning with Jimmy. If you don't want to do the embarrassing tasks that he gives you, then he screams at you. If you actually step up and show some initiative and some enthusiasm, then you're demeaned and shouted at because, in his mismatched eyes, you think you're better than him. Blech. You think you're so good? You put on the suit. You put on the suit now! Punctuating this ugliness, the crowd then does what rowdy crowds are wont to do and begin hurling things at Bobby's buns, behaving more like a horde of goblins than actual human beings. Whenever I feel afraid, I ow, a happy tune. And if you're anything like me, then seeing Bobby get this degraded and demeaned just, oh, it pisses you off. I just want to give him a hug. I just want to say, like, it'll be okay, Bobby. Get out of that fucking hot dog outfit and come over here. Bring it in, because you are worth so much more than this shitty-ass job. 
But okay, hold on. Let's take a second here. Let's take a deep breath and put our minds at ease here by appreciating the wonderful color palette used in this crowd shot, which is great. But also let's remind ourselves of that great scene from The Simpsons, which is very similar to this one, where Whitey Ford was down by Marge's pretzels. Hall of Famer Whitey Ford now on the field, pleading with the crowd for... For some kind of sanity. Uh-oh, in a barrage of pretzels now knocking Whitey unconscious. But just to boil your blood a little bit more, it is about this time that we realize that at heart, Jimmy Wichard is indeed a Batman villain. Oh, don't get me wrong, he's not one of the big boys like Two-Face or Calendar Man, but rather one of the nameless goons who are beaten up by the hundreds, one of those dudes who goes, uh, whatever you say, boss, one of those guys. He doesn't really have the talent or aspirations to accomplish any grand evils, but he still manages to make the world a worse place through small acts of cruelty. Acts that will add up over time and will snowball into something much more serious if left unchecked. And we are not the only ones who have come to realize the depth of Jimmy's depravity. Because when Hank is buying the guys some sodas from Bobby, he drops Jimmy's name in front of Dale, who then gives this very quotable moment. You told Bobby to listen to Jimmy Wichard? He was in my gun club. People say he fried his brain one day just staring at the sun. Of course, he couldn't have been too smart to do that in the first place. It's kind of a chicken egg thing. I think it is so interesting and so in character for how Dale seems to have his fingers on the pulse of the weirdos that live in Arlen. He will later reveal the dark truth about the Janes and their Omega house where they paid him in, wait for it, jams and jellies, of course. We love you, Jane. We love you, Jane. Say what you will about Dale, but the man knows how to keep tabs on the underbelly of Arlen. He is definitely the kind of guy who would give you all the most interesting side quests in an RPG, guaranteed. So let's quickly mentally prepare ourselves for what's about to happen. Take a deep breath with me right here. Because we're about to fall into a horrible septic tank. Mr. Wichard is shown here drinking on the job and, for whatever reason, decides to say this. <sighs> Make me thirsty. I need a soda. I don't care how dry that beer is. I have never finished an alcoholic drink and went, oh man, all that refreshing drink made me a touch parched. But here he is. He's out here thirsting like a Discord mod in need of a kitten, and he calls over to Bobby, telling his star employee to bring him a drink now. Run where there ain't any cars. They're going too fast. Do it, you, you monkey boy. I'm the boss of you. And there it is. This is the point where we need to use our critical thinking skills as wonderful Ferengi and say to ourselves, fuck that noise. However, peer pressure and the conditioning of our society's authority structure does make it difficult to break away from these kind of high pressure moments, and Bobby actually does try to cross the fucking tracks. And if you don't think this kind of thing can happen in real life, then just look up the Mount Washington police phone scam incident if you need proof of people bending to the unreasonable and crazy orders of an authority figure. It is a real phenomena, and it is really scary. It's almost as scary as Bobby trying to pull away from Hank when his dad is stopping him from getting himself killed, like he's struggling against Hank's grip and trying to actively fight to go across the track, like that little bit of animation there is just so disturbing and frightening that Bobby is like fighting to get himself fucking killed, my god. That's crazy, why would you do something like that? I'm giving 110% dad. And all that dangerous stuff aside, I don't even think Jimmy would have liked the soda if he had gotten it. Hank himself criticized the drinks that Bobby was handing out. Bobby, these sodas are hot. Son, you gotta find a way to be more efficient. Plus, I mean, how is Bobby gonna push the drink through that tiny grate? Jimmy would probably tell him to climb the fence or some shit. Like, it would never end. It's never going to be enough for Jimmy because he's never satisfied and always asks for more and more and more no matter how much stress it puts on other people. This bit of unreasonable child endangerment finally pushes Hank too far and, in an act that probably confuses the shit out of Bobby, Hank begins to start running across the track and nearly gets himself fucking splattered. Oh! This berserker rage state even leads Hank to kicking down the protective fence, one that is intended to hold back car accidents, and he proceeds to give Jimmy the ass whipping of a century, which Peggy thankfully documents.
After very nearly getting two of our main characters killed, it is nothing short of a blind miracle that Jimmy Wichard is able to come back in later episodes, and, more disturbing still, he actually gets some really good lines too. This looks like I pulled my thumb off. <laughs> oh, she pulled the thumb off! Call a doctor! I'm a doctor. No. It kind of breaks all the rules of likability that he's able to come back so many times and deliver such, like, memorable performances. It's really weird. It's sort of like if the dusty old Bones kid had become a student in Bobby's class and would just pop up from time to time to affect the plot, and it's just, like, why? But disregarding all of that, after Hank puts Jimmy in a medically induced coma, he then goes to Bobby and apologizes for disregarding Bobby's discomfort with Wichard. I just wanted to say... I should have listened to you when you said how bad that Witcher guy was. And I want to give you the money you earned. And this is why I don't really have an issue with characters acting a little shitty or not behaving in the most logical way possible. Because Hank's apology here feels like a really earned moment, and seeing him get humbled like this, especially when he's usually portrayed as infallible or just all-knowing, or generally the person who does the right things, reminds us that even good people with good intentions and good advice can still really honestly fuck up. And having a character fuck things up is one thing, but then having them show the guts and the humility to own up to their mistakes really makes these characters stand out. Better still, Bobby actually lets Hank off the hook for all of this and shows him that Bobby's like a childish misunderstanding about how the value of a dollar actually works isn't inherently a bad thing. I don't want money. I was happy before when you just bought all the stuff around here and there was no money involved. Just buy me a couple of pairs of short pants. And we'll call it even. <sighs> now that really does tug on the old heartstrings there. Whew, so good. So how do I feel about this layered commentary on work, bosses, and very pretty display rope? Honestly, this is kind of a miracle of an episode. On paper, the individual elements don't seem like they'd click like at all, and the entire character of Jimmy Wichard could have very easily been replaced by a much safer option, like a typical hard-ass guy who's just oh, tough on Bobby all the time, like Cotton or Coach Sowers. Aside from the climax, the writers were very careful to keep Jimmy's antics centered around humiliation and cartoonish stupidity. You owing me 88,080 eight eight hundred dollars and 88 cents besides all the good bobby stuff though i really didn't click with the nascar stuff which is kind of weird for me mostly because the jokes just don't have that much variety like okay the guys are disappointing and screwing up and hank isn't oh and the guys mess up again and hank doesn't like he's doing the whole pit crew thing basically by himself like okay sure I mean, hell, the asshole cop from the start who fucked with, like, Boomhauer's car, he actually wins the big race and gets to drive the pace car. Like, yes, Boomhauer eventually gets to do it too, but that whole plotline just peters out to nothing and doesn't really have a satisfying conclusion. Really, though, the guy's storyline is just there to get Bobby to the racetrack and get him involved in the job and keep Hank around to eventually save his son. And when viewed from this perspective, this is actually a very demanding story, one that hinges on keeping characters in very particular roles and very particular places just so we can keep things balanced and so the plot feels like it's actually going somewhere and doing something, which feels more than a little bit artificial. Unlike, say, The Wedding of Bobby Hill, which pulls off the miracle of naturally moving us from this point. Peggy and I were thinking Bobby could take care of Boomhauer's house while he's gone. I see. To this point. Mom! Dad! I've gotten Luann pregnant! Man, that one is such a doozy. It's crazy. But anyway, that's my thoughts. This is a very good episode, but one that really depends on one very specific setup. Of course, maybe I just feel that way because I have some sort of attention deficit disorder, a disorder that may require some more invasive procedures to cure. I don't like the idea of putting my boy on drugs. Isn't there some kind of operation? Oh lord, the turtle song episode. Ugh, I'm gonna get some heavy-handed comments about Peggy in that one. I can already feel them coming in and clawing at my throat. Ugh. But that's for next time. Until then, we can say that this episode, titled Life in the Fast Lane, Bobby's Saga, notice by the way, this is the third saga episode we've gotten so far, has indeed been... reviewed to death. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. Jeff Gordon's a race car driver too? I thought he was just a cereal box model.